candidates for Minnesota House Districts 67A and 67B. Uh, the forum partners today are the District 1 Community Council and St. Paul Neighborhood Network. My name is Mary Santi. I live outside the district in White Bear Township and I will be moderating. The League of Women Voters does not endorse or oppose candidates for public office or political parties. Uh, we have these candidate forums so that you can make up your mind yourself on what the candidates stand for in this election. And then if you would hold your applause till the end. Uh, the questions are being collected from uh, by ushers, so if you have a question on a card, raise your hand. Or if you need a card, raise your hand and the ushers will come and get it. We invited all candidates to be a part of this forum. And the candidates who are participating are for Dis District 67A, Tim Mahoney. And uh, Tim is running unopposed. Is that correct? That is correct. And then in District 67B, Fred Turk is here. And his opponent uh, does not seem to have come. So uh, the, the questions will be timed. Their timer has a, a sign that says 30 minutes left, uh, 30 seconds left. <laughs> and 30 minutes, yeah, that would be good. 30 seconds and then stop, and then you may complete your sentence at that time. Um, Candidates have two minutes to make an opening statement, and so we'll begin with Tim Mahoney. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you uh, to the League, and thank you to the St. Paul uh, Neighborhood Network for hosting and putting this forum together. Oh, better not forget District 1, sorry. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I am State Representative Tim Mahoney. Um, I was born and raised here on the east side. I lived here all my life except for a couple years uh, when I was sowing wild oats over there in Minneapolis someplace. <laughs> um, went to, actually went to Harding here. Uh, when I got done with Harding, I went on to St. Paul College. And for those of you who understand, it was called TVI back then. And uh, got my pipe fitters cert certificate. Uh, worked in the field for 30 years, uh, retired a few years back, and now I do legislative work full time. Um, I have uh, been on the Jobs and Economic Development Committee for my whole career there, uh, uh, and I probably will continue on that particular committee. It has jurisdiction over jobs and housing and uh, energy and um, uh, workforce training. So I do a lot of that particular work. Um, this year, my main focus will, uh, yes, the bill that I'd really like to pass this year is a really strong wage theft law. Uh, if people work 40, uh, 40 hours, they should get paid for 40 hours, not get paid for 37 or 35. Also, um, do some work on the housing crisis, both city and rural. Uh, we are having a serious lack of affordable housing, uh, some more ideas on workforce training and how we get people trained for $20 an hour jobs rather than $12 an hour jobs. Uh, there's going to be a serious look at mental health this year and uh, we're going to, well I hope we get an opportunity to do some work on gun violence prevention this year. So with that I'll, I'll close. Thank you. Now Fred Turk. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, my parents had a grocery store. I went to the University of Wisconsin, got uh, my mechanical engineering degree, um, and um, uh, got a job with 3M. I'm a, I'm a retired uh, uh, engineer from 3M. I have six patents. Um, I, after I left 3M, I, I worked at uh, um, 
Good, Goodbridge Aerospace in Egan for uh, seven years after that, working on uh, sensors for uh, jet airplanes and rocket ships and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm an Army veteran. Um, I was in the Army Reserve in Madison, Wisconsin for six years uh, with the 247th Military Intelligence Detachment. Um, I'm a former Democrat uh, until 1978. I was a I was a Democrat. I met Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale, and it was a real thrill. <laughs> a lot of a lot of those uh, famous uh, guys. Um, coached uh, soccer and baseball for uh, 15 years, uh, mostly at Battle Creek Recreation Center. So I'm a sports nut, an avid uh, runner and bicyclist. I used to put on 2,000 miles a year on my bicycle, commuting and such. Um, I'm a cancer survivor. I had uh, uh, my kidney removed two years ago. Um, and the, prop, the major thing I, I want to do is I, I pledged not to, uh, in, to, I pledged to oppose tax increases for the next two years. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn to questions now and we'll alternate between you to answer first. So this first question, Fred Turk, you would answer first. Why are you running for office? Uh, two years ago, the uh, uh, head of the our uh, basic political operating unit, BPOU, sent around an email uh, asking for candidates, and it sounded uh, like fun. I thought it sounded like fun. So uh, I wasn't able to do it then because I was uh, I still hadn't had my kidney out. So I came back two years later and uh, did it. I like going around to all the houses, uh, distributing lit literature and such. I, uh, it's it's really I find it a lot of fun. That's that's the major <laughs> reason. Oh well, I've been involved in politics all my life, uh, even after I left the Democratic Party. Uh, I. Uh, I became a Republican. I've, I've been helping out on campaigns, especially in this area, uh, in the state House of Representatives since 1978. I don't know if anybody remembers Phil Crinky. He was a friend of mine. Thank you. Okay, Tim Mahoney. I may be the only one to remember Phil, but you know, Phil was an interesting man and I enjoyed him. Um, we never agreed on anything but once, but the one time we did, the speaker who was right in the middle of a kind of a admiration to the, uh, the, the deal, the, the body, stopped dead in his tracks because Phil and I rarely ever agreed. Uh, I'm running for office uh, because I think I can offer a service and a, a value to the community. Uh, I love this community. Uh, as I said, I, was grown, I grew up here, and uh, I've got a real thing in my heart for working people and the wage step particular for me uh, and trying to bring training training opportunities to our young folks who don't really have uh, haven't found a skill once they got out of high school and uh, or their life isn't going quite the way it's going they wanted it to go or if you're at 3m and you get laid off and you want to try something new we need to have opportunities out there, and I think I can help provide those. Thank you. All right, the next question would start with Tim Mahoney. Which one issue do you think you could work on with legislators across the aisle? Um, well, thank you. Uh, people don't think we work... Uh, uh, we're always at odds with each other. And I would say about 60 to 70 percent of the time, there are issues that we don't, they're not ideological issues. They're issues that, you know, how do you get the state to work in its functions, whether it's snow plowing or, or whatever. 
Um, but one issue that I have uh, worked a lot with uh, is workers' comp. Last year, we've passed the one of the first uh, uh, bills that allows police, fire, emergency uh, responders, uh, emergency room nurses uh, to file for PTSD uh, work compensation. They can get treatment. They can take the time they need to get treatment, and uh, the insurance company pays for it. Uh, that's something that's really a function of the state in terms of how the laws and the, the uh, uh, services are provided. And then the, then the insurance companies go, the Thank state you. goes out and does that. Fred Turk. Um, one issue that I've actually reached out on is uh, sports stadiums. Um, I've, I've reached out to John Marty, who's in the state Senate, a Democrat, uh, who's very much against uh, sports stadiums. Uh, uh, and I, I think that uh, the way that the Viking Stadium was done was just uh, an abomination. They, they steamrolled the will of the people in Minneapolis. Uh, they had passed a, refer uh, 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 a referendum uh, that required um, uh, voter approval uh, to in order to build a new stadium in Minneapolis and, and uh, the legislature just steamrolled over that. So I, I would be opposed to that and I think there's a lot of Democrats uh, that, that also oppose stadium funding. Well, I, I neglected to tell you and everyone that you have an opportunity for rebuttal on each of these questions. So on this one, do either of you have anything more to add? 30 seconds for rebuttal. Oh. Well, you want to beat up and work comp? I don't want to beat up and stay <laughs> 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 All right. So this next one, we'll start with Fred Turk. Explain. No, you just laugh. Hmm? Did you just no, 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 you're right. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wrote it down, so <laughs> I'll trust that. I'll just move and learn but do call me, and everyone call me if I, if I mess up here. Explain why you would or would not support restoring voting rights to citizens living in the community while on probation or parole for a felony conviction. Um, I would be opposed to that. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the people that uh, ha have uh, felonies and convictions uh, have mental problems as well and can't, uh, aren't thinking very clearly. So uh, I, I have a close relative uh, who's in that situation and I, I, I really don't think he should vote until uh, he gets, gets it up, you know, gets it taken care of and gets back up to speed. Um, I, uh, I wholeheartedly support the idea of restoring voting rights to felons uh, and people who have served their time and or, and or are on probation. Uh, they're not in prison. They, um, and even if, I, I wouldn't go this far, but Maine allows you to vote if you're in prison. That, just because you did something wrong and you were convicted of a crime, does not mean you are not a citizen of the United States of America or the city of St. Paul. So uh, I've supported that since it came out. Uh, I have a good number of friends that have oh. gone through the, uh, the criminal justice system and they are, they are some of the best people I know and will bend over backwards to help their friends. And uh, the sad thing is that one of them who's smart and, and probably on the other side of the political aisle from me, can't vote, uh, uh, but he deserves to vote. He did his time, he's turned his life around, he's worked 20 years without any trouble, so I, I support that. But you do have rebuttal time, either of you. Hey, well, I'm uh, I, I, I don't know if I made it clear, but uh, it, once he, uh, gets the felony office record, then I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it is legal for him. 
to vote. And uh, that takes about three years. Um, uh, what happens is that people get on probation for extended periods of time. Um, and they never get their right to vote back. Um, and just because someone has committed a crime and has a mental health problem, they're no different than someone who hasn't cr cr uh, had a crime and has mental health problems. Uh, you know, I, I understand in the state, we're not, if you're in jail, you're not going to vote. But whether you have a mental health problem or not, that is not a reason to take someone's right to vote away. Thank you. All right, the next question then, we will start with Tim Mahoney. How would you work to make the legislative process more open and transparent, especially as it relates to giant omnibus bills? Uh, well, I've been thinking about that this summer a lot, and how do you do that? And there's always been this push to have there's a sing, single subject rule, uh, a rule in the uh, Constitution, and we've managed to ignore that forever. Uh, and, and I don't think that's right. I think the first step is to start to do the finance bills separate with no policy in them, and then do a policy bill um, separate. So in the bills that I typically work on, the Jobs and Economic Development, it has four or five sections in it, and they lump them all together. Um, and there are some good things, and Republicans and Democrats do it too. Um, there are some parts of the housing bill I might love and want to vote for, but not the part of what they call their jobs bill. I wouldn't have, hard, I don't think I, well, I did vote for it once. Um, so I think you separate them out into the areas that they are supposed to be in. So you could do that with Health and Human Services or the uh, DNR or any place else. Uh, to try, yeah. Red turf. Um, well, I don't have any experience with that. Yeah. I would uh, defer to Tim's judgment. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's a difficult problem uh, to, uh, to get rid of the uh, omnib omnibus bills. I know it's bad and technically illegal, but that's how it's done, you know, today. <laughs> I would like to see it differently, you know. Uh, and, and it seems to happen every session. They they uh, they ha are real enthusiastic at the start, and then they get kind of get bogged down, and then right at the end, they they do everything. So, any more to add, either of you? Uh, well, I, I'll I'll add this, and and it's a function of leadership, and again, I'll blame both sides. Um, when, when they're negotiating, they think if they hold out, the last one to give in gets the most. Well, there's some things you could do, uh, set earlier deadlines, and if you don't get that bill passed by X, Y, Z, uh, you, don't get, you don't get another shot at it. Uh, there's some things that could be pretty stringent, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's more, I get blamed for it, and I understand, but it's, it's leadership trying to negotiate to the, to the last possible minute, which is okay. unfortunate. Thank you. So, so this next question, Fred Turk, what will you do to ensure everyone has good quality, affordable health insurance? Um, <clears throat> I uh, favor in health insurance uh, going to the uh, Obamacare federal system uh, right now we have uh, Minsure, which has been a disaster, and uh, uh, a lot of people are advocating um, single-payer health care, and I think that's going to be very expensive. And three states have looked at it, three liberal states, California, uh, Vermont, and um, um, Colorado. It, it was on. It, it, it was on uh, the ballot in Colorado, and they voted it down three to one. California, they found that it would cost uh, ten thousand uh, dollars per person per year, which is about twice what we're paying for uh, insurance now. 
and I, I don't know what happened in Vermont, but that's Bernie Sanders' home state, and they couldn't pass it there. So I, I, I favor the federal system. Thank you. Uh, 40 out of 50 states have okay. that. Jim? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I uh, there's a, on Tim Walls' web, uh, website, he talks about opening up Minnesota care to all. And I think that's a good first start. I think as a society, um, we have to figure out how we can get to a single payer or Medicare for all. Uh, we can reduce our costs by 30% right away. Uh, you hear grumblings from senior citizens or people on Medi uh, Med uh, Medicare, uh, but by and large, most all of them are relatively uh, satisfied with it. And, uh, and it, and it fulfills their needs in their health care costs. Uh, I have taken a look at Jeff Johnson's and Mr. Uh, President Trump's uh, plans of these high, high deductible, low cost, low uh, service health insurance. Pre-existing conditions get, uh, they can, if you're pregnant, they can uh, uh, deny you insurance the next time get cancer, if yeah. you get any of these particular diseases that we all get or some family member gets, you can be kicked off insurance or denied insurance. So I think that Thank Minnesota you. care is probably the best way to go. Well, we'll call this part of your rebuttal. There you go. Fred Turk, do you have anything more to add on that question? Uh, to me, single payer is kind of like uh, saying uh, that we should abolish the IRS and just uh, and and so we would save all that money uh, on the on the IRS and just let people uh, to have the honor system pay, to pay their taxes. That's that's what it seems like to me. Anything further? Uh, I, that was part of my rebuttal. I went over time. Okay. <laughs> And the next question is uh, along the same lines, and the first one to speak will be Tim Mahoney. Uh, do you support a Minnesota Care buy-in? <laughs> well, I've got a minute and a half now to continue on. Um, I do support a Minnesota Care buy-in, and I think that's really a, a, a good first step. Uh, you know, across the world, Every industrialized nation has a form of single payer or national health insurance. And it works for a billion or two billion people. And I like to think of Americans as the smartest people in the world. I know I'm probably, I'd make somebody in Ireland wrong, uh, mad at me, but um, if they can do it, we can do it too. And we can do it better than any other country in the world. I don't know if people realize that for every premium I pay, my employer pays half again. So my 5,000 is really a $10,000 um, uh, policy. Uh, I, as a pipe fitter, I paid all of my insurance costs out of my paycheck. And it was $15,000 a year. It's been costing $15,000 a year for the last 20 years for good health insurance. Turk. Um, I do not uh, support uh, Minnesota Care buy-in. Uh, the rates that they pay uh, for Minnesota uh, Care buy-in are, are pretty low, and that would tend to put uh, hospitals out of business and that, that sort of thing. Okay, anything further to add, either of you? Well, sure. Um, last year, we did about a billion dollar worth of subsidies to insurance companies to, to bring insurance premiums down. If we'd spent that billion dollars on Minnesota Care and subsidizing Minnesota Care, and our our uh, our back office costs are lower with Minnesota Care, could have done more people rather than subsidize insurance companies, which we do all the time. Any more for you? No. Okay. Next question goes first to Fred Turk. Do you support requiring criminal background checks on every gun sale? Explain your answer. Um, 
it uh, presently is not required. There, there are no criminal background checks. Is that correct? I don't have that answer. I'm, I I'm think they're the one answering questions. Yeah. I don't own a gun, and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not a hunter or anything. I'm not an NRA member. Um, so I, uh, I, I do support common sense uh, gun control efforts. And uh, that's something I could reach across the aisle on. Um, it uh, just on the uh, surface, it seems like uh, criminal background checks might uh, might make sense. Kim Mahoney, um, as it stands now, uh, if you're buying a a firearm through a federal licensed uh, dealer, uh, you're going to get a background check. But if you buy it at a gun show or online or any number of different areas, you're not. Uh, I own guns. Uh, I have my pipe fitter friends own a lot of guns. <laughs> um, and I don't want to take anyone's gun away. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I think we should have a, um, a, a um, the background check. I, and I don't want to go into the, whether it's a criminal background check or not. But I think if you're buying a gun, you should have to have a background check to make sure that you are not a domestic abuser or a felon or any number of other particular pieces to it. One thing I will say is I, I know good friends who have had guns that have been passed down from great grandfather to grandfather to father to, to, to son. Um, and we need to make sure that those are not uh, covered under this particular law. If a gun's been in your family for 100 years, you should be able to have it, keep it. So further, further comments on this topic? No. no. Uh, 30 seconds. We should also have a way to take away guns um, from people who are uh, either going to do harm to themselves or um, to others. So domestic abusers, it's the can't remember what they call it, but it's one of the bigger issues around the country, and we have some of those laws in, in a number of different states. I think that could work here too. All right, this next, you kind of touched on this next question, and this one, Tim Mahoney will, will begin. What would you do to ensure all victims of domestic violence receive the protection and services they need? That's a $64,000 question. Um, protection, uh, again, you know, you, well, men have to change the culture. It really is a cultural thing for men. 90% uh, of the domestic abusers are, are, are men. Uh, we as fathers uh, and young men's mothers need to teach that respect. Uh, if you get that mad, you just need to get up, walk out the door, and close it behind you, and go cool off. Um, the guns, uh, the red flag law, I think it's called, is where if uh, I had a son and I thought he was going to be crazy and beating his wife or girlfriend, um, uh, I could call the police and say, you know, we need to take these guns away, and, and it becomes a high priority for the courts to take a look at it. Oh, I think those are two things we can. The services, um, well, we just need to fund them the way they need to be funded and, and provide good, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, of counselors for the victims of domestic violence. Thank you. Fred Turk. Uh, <clears throat> I suspect they already have pretty good assurances you know they're they're doing as uh, the the best job that they can. It's not like domestic assault is anything new. It's been around for a long time, so I'd have to study that uh, uh, to see if there are any shortcomings. I know there there's still is domestic assault, but uh, uh, I I I don't know where where we're falling short. One one thing I could say is I I wouldn't want to have uh, somebody who's accused of domestic assault be my attorney general. I stand with the National Organization of Women on that. I 
Anything further, either of you? I, in, in the domestic violence, if someone has committed it one time against a person, the most likely person to commit it again uh, t uh, on that particular victim is the same person. Um, it, it, we can and we need to do better. Um, uh, there's no reason a woman should be afraid to go to sleep or get up in the morning in her own home. There's none. And we can and we should and we haven't done as good, a good enough job. Anything further? Um, <clears throat> one thing I could say is um, we uh, have, bit my, my own family has been a victim of uh, domestic violence. And uh, one thing that would help uh, is uh, to uh, fix the uh, HIPAA laws. The, uh, there's uh, we, the one of the top priorities of uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce is uh, to to uh, conform the HIPAA laws between Minnesota and uh, the federal. Right now they're different, uh, and. Uh, uh, it's very hard to get a hold of uh, records or have, have uh, agencies share records. Doing that would save about $200 million a year. But you could do a rebuttal, either of you. Yeah, no, that's all right. I think that finished. Uh, this is the last question I have, unless there are some to be brought forward. Um, we'll ask this one and start closing statements but I see some coming good so this one is to start with Fred Turk how would you work to ensure Minnesota has secure elections and voting uh, secure elections well I would support uh, voter ID I do I do support voter ID I don't think I don't think that's too big of an ask uh, and I, I do think there's more voter fraud around than uh, uh, than people are letting on and some of our elections are extremely close uh, that's that's pretty much what I would have to say about that uh, I would fully f fully fund the, s the Secretary of State um, and his cyber se cyber security uh, initiative that was not done last year um, in the last budget cycle, I should say. Um, and I'd tell the Russians to stay out of it. I mean, look, I feel that I feel that they made a mess of it last time. Um, and voter fraud, the state of Minnesota. The nation, it's 0.001 percent of the of a hundred thousand voters. 0.001 percent per hundred thousand of voters. Uh, uh, anyone does something wrong, and that's that's including those that are making honest mistakes. It's not fraud. Somebody voted in the wrong, not the wrong precinct, but thought they were still registered at some place or they were a felon or whatever that voted. So I don't think it's a big issue. I think it's it, it, I think it's a political issue for people to make points on. Any further? Okay, this next question will go first to Tim Honey. Where do you stand on getting an equal rights amendment in the Minnesota Constitution? And in the U.S. Constitution, why? Um, I, I've been a supporter of the Equal Rights uh, Amendment since it was uh, in the 70s. Uh, I think it's a <laughs> it's pretty obvious women don't have equal rights when they get paid 85 cents on the dollar. It's pretty uh, pretty obvious that women don't have the same rights when men get to make rules on their their on how. Their reproductive rights are done. Um, so, the Minnesota Constitution—I'm—that's I'm, a 
piece that has to be voted on by the public. Uh, uh, nationally, uh, it's a better way to go nationally and, and, and make it nationwide because otherwise you'll have Wisconsin, if, Tom, if, if Scott Walker is reelected, women will make 65 cents in, on the dollar and even if they, because they would figure their constitution differently than we would, even if we were paying uh, 100, if ours was requiring 100%. Uh, I think one thing we can do is we can, oh, I'll stop and get it in on the rebuttal. Get it in on your rebuttal. <laughs> Fred Turk. Uh, I don't put a very high priority on that, We on the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, it's, uh, it's very tough to uh, change the Constitution. We went through that in the 1970s and it didn't work. So uh, uh, I think there's probably better things that we can be working on. Um, I'll just rebut by saying this, that, um, uh, no, I won't, won't go there, I'll just leave it alone. Go on to the next? Yeah. Or add more? Okay. This one will start with Fred Turk. Do you support the $15 minimum wage? Why or why not? I do not uh, support the $15 minimum wage. I support uh, people getting, uh, raising their wages by increased pro productivity and uh, uh, and a better economy. Studies have shown, one uh, in particular in Seattle, that uh, it, the workers are worse off with a $15 an hour wage, minimum wage, than, than if they uh, uh, didn't have that. And uh, in addition, um, I think that hurts youth unemployment. I worked for my father for many years when I was uh, in junior high school and high school, uh, got paid a dollar an hour, uh, uh, and uh, that was big money back in those days. Uh, but I, it, it's, you know, uh, a lot of people aren't uh, so having to support families, and it, it gives them good experience to, to uh, uh, have part-time jobs. Tim Mahoney? I've supported the $15 minimum wage for, uh, since it became an issue. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, it's basically minimum wage from 1950 uh, added up to uh, adjusted for inflation. That's where we'd be. We'd be at $15 an hour. We're asking people, and too often people are working at McDonald's as their primary job, and they're in their middle 30s. That's how they're supporting their family. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a bill, and I've been trying for years to put a bill, get a bill passed. The state does interest-free loans and grants to businesses. And they have to pay $13.50 an hour. Why is the state investing in a job that pays $13.50 an hour with including benefits? We need to get that at $19.50 an hour. We do $50 million worth of grants and loans every, every budgetary cycle, every two years. Thank you. Hurry battle. You know, uh, large businesses and medium-sized businesses, we've had the best 10 years uh, of growth in, in our history. We've had the best 10 years of economic growth in, the, in our history uh, uh, in, in modern times. And businesses have made money, stockholders have made money. Everybody has seen the benefits of it but the person who works for a living actually does the job. So frankly, if it's $15 an hour, that's just fine because businesses need to start sharing that particular uh, productivity increase. Any further rebuttal? Well, uh, if the workers are worse off with a $15 uh, an hour minimum wage, as it was shown in the Seattle study that I mentioned, uh, what's the point, you know? Uh, the, it, it just kind of goofs up the economy uh, to, to have 
a requirement like that. Okay, next question. We'll start with Tim Mahoney. And this is the last question I have. So, ushers, if there are more questions to bring, bring them up. Um, how can we help our farmers, business owners, and consumers when the federal government creates trade policies that negatively impact us? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I start? Yes. I, I'm gonna go back to the last one. You know, there's studies on both sides of the issue that the $15 minimum wage hurts and helps. Most, most of the studies that say it hurts have been paid for by billionaires, have been paid for by billionaires and right-wing think tanks. So I, I don't buy the studies out of Seattle and a number of others. And the question was what? Was, uh, how can we help farmers, business owners, and consumers when the federal government creates trade policies that negatively impact us? Um, <laughs> elect a new president. <laughs> Pretty simple, because the president sets most of those policies. Fred Turk. Um, I think the farmers support President Trump, and they're with him on this. They realize this is a short-term uh, kind of a deal uh, with the with the tariffs and such. Uh, I don't. I don't think President Trump has lost a lot of support. How can we help uh, the farmers? Uh, uh, the 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 big one is the this uh, uh, declaration that uh, the Dayton administration made uh, f to require uh, land for for drainage took away a lot of farmland. Uh, and and it wasn't uh, submitted to the legislature. He just kind of, you know, required it. And I think the farmers are very much up in arms about that. If you go out into outstate Minnesota, I, I think you'll find that Governor Dayton is not very popular for, for that and a lot of other reasons. Thank you. Uh, any further? The rebuttal is, uh, uh, I, I will say it this way. Uh, President Trump's farm policy has is one of the big reasons we have never, ever put money into mental health for farmers. They're already talking three or four million dollars worth of people, uh, hires for farmers' mental health. In other words, counselors and psychologists to go to farmers when they're having problems, mental health problems. I, I, I am on the Ag Committee. I have made phone calls to a dozen different uh, farmers that I know, and each one of them under this trade policy, these tariffs have lost at least $50,000 worth of income. One of them lost $250,000 already this year. Now, that's a big farmer. He's going to survive. Some, a lot of them aren't. Thank you. Next question. We begin with Fred Turk. The youth um, are our future. What will you do to help foster a positive impact on youth in the east side, especially in regard to education? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I had a teacher's license for 10 years, and I had a teacher's certification. I, I, uh, I actually did my student teaching here at Harding. Um, and a couple of things that I noticed is I, I thought that the curriculum, I, I taught math, and I thought the curriculum was pretty poor. Uh, and I, I don't know what the deal was with that, but I, I don't think the kids were learning math very well. The other thing uh, I noticed uh, in uh, high school is that uh, I, I had to fail some kids in in math here at Harding, and that made me that, that upset me. But then I looked; they were failing in every other class too. I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of kids that are failing every class. I think that uh, uh, both the the school has fa failed the kids, and uh, the uh, kids have failed. Uh, and something has to be done about that. They shouldn't be back at Harding 
if they fail every class. You know, and th those are the most disruptive students. Okay, Ch Jim Mahoney. Um, that's a pretty broad range question. I mean, the, the sky is the limit, so to speak, on that. Um, one of the things that I think would really, really help is if we got uh, technical training, career and technical training back into the high school level rather than at the uh, post-secondary ed education. Uh, frankly, one of the reasons, the only reasons I came to school in my senior year in high school was to go to shop class. Um, and, and there's a lot of kids like me out there. Uh, I had a mother that wasn't going to take uh, failure for an an for a, uh, an answer, and she she pushed me a little uh, pretty hard. Um, I think the other piece is that we can improve our workforce training pieces. I think we can improve our and this is a city issue, not a state issue, but we really need to improve the programming at our local parks and recs. Um, uh, I, I think. I'd love to see smaller class sizes so students could get a little bit more individual training, but we've got an awful lot of needs within our school system. Uh, and before we go to reducing the class sizes dramatically, we have to fulfill those. Uh, counselors, nurses, a number of other things that we should get. Further rebuttals? Uh, I think that's a good point uh, that Tim's making. But uh, in addition, I would say that uh, school discipline is a big issue in the schools. Um, and I, uh, I'm particularly, uh, I, I don't like uh, the fact that the attorney general has threatened to sue like 58 different school districts because of their discipline policies. I think we should uh, trust the uh, uh the people on the ground, the principals and teachers, uh, to to run the discipline. Jim Mahoney, I have some issues with the school discipline system also, but we need to be very very careful because the statistics show that uh, children of color are disciplined more often and more severe than children uh, that that look like, like me. Well, a little better looking because their skin isn't as old. But um, uh, so we, we need to be very careful how we do that. And uh, I, you're correct, school discipline is an issue and kids should not disrupt the classroom. Any further? Well, uh, if, if the uh, ratios are a little bit different we're we're diverse, you know. Uh, <laughs> they are not I, I don't. Different. They don't they have not to. Not a little different. They are not a little different. They are horribly different. Uh, no, I mean the well, the the amount of discipline. But I think if a kid, uh, regardless of color, if he deserves to be suspended, he should be suspended. The other thing I object to is uh, uh, paying uh, teachers or uh, uh, principals bonuses. Uh, to, to make their discipline uh, outcomes a little bit better. And I think that that, that was a big factor in the uh, Parkland, or, uh, yeah, Parkland school down in Florida and that school shooting. Uh, they wanted to uh, uh, decrease the, the uh, school to prison pipeline and they just stopped reporting any crimes in the schools. So that's... Discipline pol policy is a big thing. An interesting question, but we are out of time for that one. Here, here comes the next. Yeah, there's a subtle hint for somebody to write one down. Write some more <laughs> down, yeah. Um, this one starts with Tim Mahoney. There were three murders that occurred within a week span on the east side in September. What would you do to decrease any kind of violence on the east side? Uh, well, that's a legislative issue, again, at the, uh, on, on the, the uh, what is it, is it the Public Safety Committee? Um, you know, but it could go hand in hand with the Jobs Committee. I mean, if, if these people, if this group of people, whether they're people of color or not, whether they're men or they're women or they're whatever, if they were working, they're not likely to, uh, to do that. If we get people started on the right path, that's the best thing that we could do for, uh, 
crime prevention. I keep people busy working and, and living a life that we all want to live. Um, the other piece to that is uh, our prisons, if we're going to send somebody to prison, they should not come out worse than they went in. So whether it's uh, technical training, um, the psychological help, uh, chemical dependency, because 95% of the people in prison have uh, chemical dependency problems, uh, we can do some of that. Now, individually to the east side, I, I, I can't give you a, you know, a police officer's answer. Fred Turk. Um, I don't know how much that's uh, a state issue. It might be more of a city issue uh, to uh, police the, the, the streets of uh, Twin Cities. But I, I agree with Tim. Uh, you know, getting kids jobs and where they can get some money, and they, uh, that that would help a lot. Anything further? My rebuttal, and it's not much of a rebuttal, but it is it is a state, city, county um, uh, joint. It, it not required by law, but the state and the county and the cities, we all have to work together. Um, our kids are too precious. Um, and frankly, they're going to pay our Social Security, so we should really take care of them. The next question uh, starts first with Fred Turk. A lot of interest has been generated regarding the abuse allegations against Keith Ellison and Justice Kavanaugh. What is your comment on these recent events? Um, I would take Justice Kavanaugh first. Um, those charges are uncorroborated uh, 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 that uh, Mary or uh, Blasey Ford lady, she said pe other people knew about that and, and uh, they, none of those people cor corroborated what she said. So uh, what that uh, senator from Maine, Maine Collins, uh, her speech, I think, said it all for me that, uh, that they were kind of fishy charges. As far as Ellison goes, those were just a couple years ago, and uh, it, it wasn't that, uh, that lady that, uh, that brought this subject up. It was her son who had seen the video. So there, there was corroboration. There are police reports, and the medical records have been released. So uh, I think uh, 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 Keith Ellison's charges are much more serious. Tim Mahoney. Um, could you repeat the question? A lot of interest has been generated regarding the abuse allegations against Keith Ellison and Justice Kavanaugh. What is your comment on these recent events? Well, uh, the comment I would probably make is, uh, I am a little concerned uh, anytime we as a nation, we as a city, or we as just individuals can uh, do guilty before innocence. That's just not the way our system is supposed to work. Um, and you know, the charges, uh, I'll take Kavanaugh first. Uh, she provided 23 names or 31 names, I can't remember which, and the FBI never, never went and um, uh, interviewed them. Uh, Keith Ellison, uh, it's been looked into a couple of, with a couple of uh, uh, organizations, uh, and, and they don't, they didn't see anything. If whatever her, his, his past girlfriend's is, name is, I can't remember, um, if, if there's a video of it, that sets this whole thing into a different world. And if she has it, she should bring it forward. She doesn't necessarily have to show it on YouTube uh, if there's you. embarrassing pieces to it. Uh, the other thing I would say about uh, this Blasey Ford lady is they, uh, they held on to those charges uh, for weeks. Uh, they could have done a much better investigation of them had they brought them forth immediately. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and then... Uh, during that time that they withheld the charges, they scrubbed all her social media 
uh, and uh, things like that. So you couldn't look into her past. You can't even look at her high school annual uh, now. You know, uh, they, they censored that. Well, uh, I, my rebuttal is, yeah, look at how wonderful she was treated. She was put on trial. And she, she can't go home. She's got death threats against her. Uh, I'm surprised she hasn't lost her job for one reason or another. Um, there's a reason women do not come forward. There is a reason women will not come forward with these charges because the system is rigged against them. Um, uh, and so, again, I wish the, uh, in the Ellison's case, they would come forward with the, uh, the video. Uh, and with the Kavanaugh, I wish we could have had a, a, an actual long, lengthy investigation but she didn't, she did not want to come forward with that because she knew exactly what was going to happen. There's death threats and she can't even go home right now. Well, uh, thank you. That, that's all we have for this question. We'll go on to the next and might want to put your answer into that one if you want, you could. Uh, Tim Mahoney will go first on this. What are some ways that you plan to approach the housing issues within our district? Within our district? Um, <laughs> I was hoping it was going to be a statewide housing issue. I've got, I've got a good answer for that one. Uh, on the east side, uh, what we need to do is we have to, uh, we have to make it easier for people to become homeowners. Uh, in the last housing crisis, when uh, all these houses went into foreclosure, we had a lot of suburban landlords come in and buy the houses up. So whereas we used to be 70% homeowners on the east side, we're now in the 40%. And that, that's a huge difference. So uh, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, we need to come up with uh, programs that help inner city neighborhoods change back f to home ownership. Uh, you know, if there's certain help that those families that buy those homes need, whether it's classes on how to be a homeowner, that's fine, we can do that. And that would be the biggest issue for us. We're also going a growing city, again, finally. So we're gonna have the same growing pains that Minneapolis is having with its 2040 plan. And fortunately, just before you ask, I have not thought about how we would do that. <laughs> so I have no answer for how we would do that. Brad Turk. Um, well, I think one thing we could do to help uh, housing is uh, not raise property taxes 38% in two years. Uh, that, that increases the cost of housing. Uh, and that is what we have had the last two years uh, in St. Paul. Um, I have to say, uh, I, I delivered... Uh, uh, literature to 3,000 homes two years ago in this election and 5, 000, over 5,000 this year. Uh, and I, I've noticed, I mean, you get around the city, the, the di district quite a bit. I think the district is do doing much better. We were very slow to come out of the recession, but I, I have to say that uh, it, it is doing better. But holding property taxes down uh, would help. I get my 30 second. Um, well, and this is falls on the state. Uh, Governor Pawlenty cut local government aid dramatically, and we're still 30 million dollars a year, uh, a, a budgetary cycle behind where we were uh, when he made his cuts. And so, you know, you want to blame the, the mayor or the city for the property taxes, but a, a chunk of that falls on state government and its lack of local government aid, something we have been doing um, for 50 years to even out because you have very wealthy suburbs like Eden Prairie or high industrial suburbs like Bloomington. Um, they pay their fair share. They're great people. Um, but we support them just as much as they support us, probably more because more of our services go up. Fred Turk. Well, it shouldn't be up to the rest of the state uh, to pay for people's housing in St. Paul, Paul, you know. I mean, uh, uh, lower government aid 
is is lower taxes overall. <clears throat> That's it. Then here's a follow-up, and it will go first to Fred Turk. Uh, how would you address statewide housing issues? Um, I haven't given that a lot of thought. I don't know uh, what, I mean, there, there are a lot of housing is issues, but I think if you can bring the cost down, uh, you know that's that, that would that would help make it make it more affordable. The other thing I would say uh, in in St. Paul housing, um, I think a big part of uh, the uh, I improvement in housing in St. Paul has been the Asian community. The, there's a lot of Asian uh, homeowners among, in particular, uh, that have bought houses in the last few years and they're keeping them fixed up. So I think that's a good thing. Okay. Um, statewide, there's a, a number of issues and a number of problems. Uh, it costs the same, uh, well, there's an example. They use non-union labor out in greater Minnesota, and they tell us that it costs the same as using union labor in, in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So um, you can take that for what it's worth. But they say they cannot build low-income housing or moderate-income housing in greater Minnesota because unless there's this huge subsidy, uh, $30,000, $50,000 dollars per unit. And um, uh, Thief River Falls is a great example. They've got 3,000 jobs coming, and they've only been able to figure out a way to build, I think it's 100 and, or 260 homes, new, new apartment buildings, uh, apartment units. Um, so I think you should... We need to figure out a way to make it simpler for mobile home, uh, manufactured homes to do a condo-like system where if you own a manufactured home, you also own the land underneath. That's one of the reasons that a uh, bank will not give you a mortgage on it. There are uh, sewer hookup charges that cities use, and it, cities use them as a piggy bank. Um, I, I could go on, um, cities use uh, and inspection fees and permit fees, they yeah. overcharge on them. Uh, we can bring down the okay. cost of housing. Thank you. Uh, one, okay. thing I would, uh, one thing I would add uh, out, out state to help people out state would be to uh, build the pipelines that uh, the Dayton administration has uh, slow walked, build the mining projects, give people good jobs out state, uh, and they'll, they'll build the houses. I've never heard the pipeline used as a housing issue. Um, I, I'll just continue that uh, our issues are the same, both state, uh, statewide and, and urban-wise. So we should be able to come up with programs and, 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 and dollars that serve both greater Minnesota and urban Minnesota. And it's something we really, really need because the American dream is partially is to own a home. Uh, the American dream is to provide for your family, and you can't do that. I've door knocked out in some of those places. Thank you. I wouldn't have my dog live in some of those houses out there Thank you. that they've got people living in. Did we do rebuttals? Yes, we did. Um, we'll go to the next question, and Fred Turk, you will be the first to answer. What will you do to address the impacts of racism in Minnesota? Uh, I, I guess uh, I don't really have an answer to that. I hadn't thought a lot, a lot about that. Um, at a loss. Okay. Um, I think in some respects we've, uh, we've addressed that a little bit tonight with the, uh, high, the school disciplinarian stuff and the uh, ratio of people of color to white, family, white kids getting uh, disciplined. Um, I think the, uh, the job training, that which I'm talking about earlier, the $19.50 an hour or training people for $20 an hour jobs versus uh, $12 an hour jobs. 
uh, really will go quite a ways to the racism. The other piece, though, is we all have to look at our, you know, our inherent racism. We all have it, uh, even the best of people. Uh, just it, it, it's something we don't even think about. It just we we act on it, um, and we all have to do that. We all have to look at how that plays out and how that hurts people. Um, and then I think our laws, you know, as legislators or as a city council person, or mayor, or governor, you have to look at it as a, look at issues through an equity lens. Doesn't mean that Thank they are the only thing you're going to do with it, but you should look at it and think about it before you sign it on. Well, um, after thinking about it, uh, one thing I would do is maybe try to listen to to people, you know, uh, to listen to what their issues are about about racism. I think uh, what you hear on TV and you know, it's so kind of uh, not genuine to me, but it, it, if there are specific issues, specific problems, you know, I, I would listen to them. Can we get a rebuttal here? Pardon me? Have we done our rebuttal yet? You know, who's keeping track? <laughs> he was. He did a rebuttal and you can do it again. I, I, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, there was an African American legislator from North Minneapolis when I was early on in my career at the Capitol. And he counted up how many times he was stopped going from his home in North Minneapolis to go pick up his wife who worked over by the hospital over in Golden Valley. Never sped, always wearing a suit. This guy was stopped at least once a month. Once a month. There is racism in this world, and we need to think through it. Okay, next question. We'll start first with Tim Mahoney. Whole other topic. Um, Minnesota can now collect online sales tax. How will that additional revenue be used? I don't know. <laughs> oh. um, you know, that's hard to say. I mean, there are tons of needs. Uh, we have a budget surplus. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it goes to some of our transportation issues would be nice because our bus system, both urban and rural, uh, is not as good as it should be. Um, hopefully, if we have extra money, we have three or four billion dollars worth of um, uh, repair and replace uh, of uh, of our s like parks and our, um, our our facilities, our units that we as citizens go to every day. Uh, there's always something you can find to do with the money. Uh, I, you know, if we're getting surpluses, we need to stop raising money. <laughs> we just need to stop. We shouldn't be having half a billion dollar surpluses every year. Fred Turk, if it were up to me, I would give the money back to the taxpayers some other way. Uh, it, it, it just because it suddenly becomes uh, mandatory to collect sales taxes, that's that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we should take that money and spend it on something uh, that, that the state should do. That let's give it back, put it back in the pockets of the taxpayers. Any further? Well, I, I'm, you know. Uh, you hear the line, put, give it back, or put it back in the pocket of the taxpayers. Uh, you know, frankly, we have really smart people. That's not as simple as you think it is. I mean, I can't go to, to Amazon and say, give me your purchasing list, your customer list. They're not going to give it to me. So I can't get that money back to them. Uh, I can't go to Holiday Station and say, give me your customer list and how much they spent in their sales tax. We can do estimates. And that's where the Jesse checks from 20 years ago came. I, I, I really do believe we are collecting more than enough taxes right now, and uh, I don't want to collect any more. I mean, we're a high tax state. We don't need to be a. Fred Turk. Leave it at that. Okay. This next question is a follow-up to the ERA question, and so the first to answer will be um, Tim Mahoney. 
is an ERA important to get rid of the wage gap? Why shouldn't, um, I can't read it, 51% of the population have the same rights as men? Um, I, I, well, I can't disagree with that. They should have the same rights. Um, um, the wage gap is a combination of many things, uh, historical and just it's an advantage businesses can take advantage of. If you have the opportunity to pay somebody 85 cents and they don't you know, say anything, uh, 85 cents on the dollar that you're paying the other person, you're going to do it. It's not morally right. It's not uh, uh, it's capitalism at its best, folks. Um, I think one of the bills that we should pass is one that I've signed on to and I'll probably carry this year is that businesses are not able to ask uh, what you made at your last job. So you can negotiate from a clean slate because that's typically what they do is they say, well, what's your salary range at your last job? And they know that they pay $100,000 for the job at this place that they they're want to do. Thank you. But you say your range was $65,000. And we dropped a number now. Right. Sure. Could you repeat the question, please? Is an ERA important to get rid of the wage gap? And why shouldn't 51% of the population have the same rights as men? Well, uh, we're biologically different. And because women historically have uh, taken care of the children uh, and have taken on more of the responsibility for that, and I, I don't think, and I think that accounts for a lot of the uh, difference in the wage gap. I I I, th I don't think the wage gap is necessarily bad, uh, but I you know I believe in cooperation between men and women. I believe that uh, men should uh, uh, support their children. Uh, I, I strongly believe in that, but um, I don't think the, the the wage gap is necessarily a bad thing. Or and and I do th I do think that there is an explanation for that. That we're biologically uh, different than that. Women, well, and, and, and also women have tended to uh, go into the more caring uh, professions that probably don't pay as much. No further comments, either of you. Um, boy. If a woman... Uh, um, uh, I'm flabbergasted. Biologically, women are different, so they should be paid less? Really? It just works out that way. <laughs> um, no, it doesn't work out that way. It's forced upon women because men have got it pretty pretty good. We've got it great. I just spent the weekend with my, my daughter and her one-year-old, and the work that she did, I, like, I'm going, she's got a pretty a great husband, and he does a ton, and she's always chasing that kid. Okay. And, you know, that's a lot more work than anything I've ever done. Anything more for you, Fred Turk? Well, we have two questions left, just about enough time for them. So this question is going first to Fred Turk. How do you feel about changing the voting age to 16? <laughs> Uh, I'd be against that. I think 18 is plenty low enough. Well, if we start to draft, it, if we started a draft at 16, maybe, but no, because um, <laughs> that's how the 18-year-old came along, 18-year-old voting right. Because you right. could get drafted at 18, you may as well vote. I wouldn't support a 16-year-old. Uh, You're unanimous. Though. Yeah, we're we're in agreement. Okay, no rebuttals either. Nope. All right. I don't have one, do you? <laughs> Last question. And this first one, uh, it goes to Tim Mahoney first. What are the biggest issues constituents in your district face, and how would you work to solve them? Uh, um, 
Well, what I've heard at the door, and even not having an opponent, I do door knock, uh, is health care. It's a huge issue, and how do I afford it? How do I get a good, a good doctor? How do I bl- this, that, or the other thing? And as we said earlier in the evening, uh, I think opening up uh, Minnesota Care uh, and some of our is probably the, the best first step. Um, housing is another, and I t- we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, crime is always an issue, and I think it's much better to train someone than to incarcerate someone. Um, so I think those are some of the issues that we're going to have to deal with. Um, um, but the health care, at the end of the day, uh, well, what we do have to do is we have to address the, uh, the addiction problem that we as a nation have, not just the east side. And, but it affects the east side dramatically. And <coughs> we have to uh, uh, do a better job of getting people in the treatment and getting them cleaned up and, and moving on. Thank you. Fred Dirk. Um, the, the one that people have mentioned the most is uh, probably health care to me. And uh, as I've said, I support going to the Obamacare federal exchange, which 40 out of the 50 states use. I, uh, I've also said uh, that we should conform the uh, HIPAA laws, which would save $200 million a year. Um, Jeff Johnson taught the, the Republican candidate for governor talks about uh, uh, opening up uh, insurance to uh, uh, outside of uh, out of state enterprises. It's somehow restricted within the, within the state right right now. That's that's another thing we can do. We got to chip away at the cost of that. But I'll, I would say the bread and butter issues, the uh, uh, keeping taxes down that. That's that's a big issue, uh, you know. Money, <laughs> that's that's the biggest issue with with the people. Uh, oh, oh, well, okay. Well, okay. Let's. If you want to add anything more, you each have well, uh, thirty seconds. Um, uh, the what I wanted to mention was uh, I, I I can mention it later. It's kind of off topic, so th- that's well, fine. This is our last question. The last question. Oh, okay. Uh, tax conformity. I think that that was the number one issue this last um, uh, session, and uh, there was, I believe, a bipartisan bill passed to conform uh, our state taxes to the federal taxes, and Governor Dayton uh, held out for more money and then vetoed the bill. So uh, the St. Paul Pioneer Press has said that is going to, uh, on the average, take uh, an extra six hours you'll have to spend on your taxes. because So, so I would put a high priority on passing uh, tax conformity. And final uh, rebuttal. Uh, well, on the tax conformity, uh, I will just say the last session, um, in my committee, there was 127 pages of poison pills in the bill. The tax conformity had six or eight of the worst poison pills. So if they were going to do that, they were going to have to, and and this isn't what it was, they're going to have to drug test welfare folks, something that we've all said doesn't make sense, or whatever it was. I can't remember because it's been too much damage from sitting in legislative hearings. Um, But we should, uh, tax conformity is something that could have passed, should have passed, would have passed, but for the poison pills that... Uh, speaker doubt put on the on the bills. Thank That's you. Mine. And that is all the questions you have submitted. So we'll turn now to your final statements, and they'll be in reverse order. So Fred Turk, you have two minutes for closing statement. Okay. Well, uh, I just would like to uh, ask for your vote. I think uh, 90%, as Woody Allen said, 90% of success in a job is uh, showing up, and I'm here. So please vote for me. <laughs> I would, I would, I would like to see that. And I, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm glad that people were open-minded, and uh, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Tim Mahoney. Um, 
Well, I want I, I want to again extend my thanks to the League of Women Voters, the District Council, and, and the uh, St. Paul uh, Neighborhood Network. Uh, I think I've done a, a really good job uh, bringing forth the issues that affect the East Side and affect St. Paul in and of themselves and the capital in my career there. And I'd like to continue to do that. I think uh, I think St. Paul needs a strong advocate at the uh, the capital. I think the East Side needs a strong advocate at the capital. Uh, that is me. I love this place. I, I have grown up here. Uh, I never want to move off the East Side. Uh, uh, I don't care if it doesn't have the best, you know, the, the the fanciest restaurants or the movie theaters that everybody wants to go to or the, the Ordway over here. This is where real people live. And I always want to stay with real people. So please vote for me. You don't have many other options, though, other than right in. I, I just want to make it clear I'm not running against Tim. No. No. Uh, against each other. So that, that concludes our forum. Thank you for the District 1 um, Community Council, the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, to uh, Harding High School for the facility, league volunteers, and especially to you, the audience, for your interest and your uh, participation. Uh, election day is November 6th. Let your voice be heard by voting. So you can, you can applaud now. Thank you.